Hello, it's Mr. White. I wanted to go through and uh, point out a couple of things, uh, just in general with rhetorical analysis, and then go through and actually do the close reading, break into some bucket ideas uh, for how to approach the essay using the Clarence Jones prologue. As far as the class goes, those of you who submitted it, uh, the essay, the revision, the essay, um, I'm going to have all of those graded, hopefully, before the end of the weekend and have feedback for you. If those of you who turned it in late, no guarantees. Um, so I have other classes I have to get with for the AP exam as well that have other stuff going on. Uh, but I will definitely try. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I wanted to have a video that everybody could watch that might help answer some questions. Uh, and those who didn't get their essays graded in time for the feedback would at least have this to kind of go through and use as a benchmark. Okay, a couple of big things. Um, first off, I'm going to kind of go in order that these things come up. Um, most of you are doing a pretty good job with this, but first thing is that your introduction is mostly a rhetorical situation. Uh, when you receive an essay, there's already a rhetorical situation. That's pretty much what this is that they give you to read. And it's really important. So go through, read that. You just need to take this and tweak it. They're getting you ready to read this piece. Okay. You have to get your audience ready to read your essay. So a lot of the information is going to be the same. So we worked on Space Cat throughout the year. That's supposed to be a way that you can just go through and get the important context from a piece uh, so that when you go to write your essay, you can work it into a one or two sentence uh, rhetorical situation. So most of what's here, you're going to regurgitate. You might have to tweak a few things here and there because this is going to be for your rhetorical analysis essay. Um, so you're going to, you know, maybe tweak a little things as necessary. But read through this, read through it carefully, understand what's going on, um, and then read, close read the essay. When you go to write your essay, the first thing you're going to do is create your own rhetorical situation. Um, don't plagiarize what's here. This is somebody else's work. Um, but you can definitely put the same information. So just put it in your own words. Um, and then the other part of your introduction, of course, is going to be your thesis. Um, the thesis, there's a little bit of back and forth that's been going on, uh, open thesis versus closed thesis. And what they want to get away from with students is you having a super simple thesis where you're just dropping techniques down. We talk about name dropping sometimes. I tell you to avoid academic vocabulary. Don't just start throwing down the names of techniques. Uh, I've always told you to, you know, think about and state explicitly what the purpose of the piece is, the author, what they're trying to do overall. And then you want to identify some of the major rhetorical techniques that they use. The trick is there's sort of this nice in-between that we can do uh, where we have that nice structured thesis that sort of provides a roadmap for the rest of your essay, yet it can also be somewhat sophisticated. It doesn't have to be just a bunch of techniques dropped down. Um, for instance, let's take a look so you know what I'm talking about. Instead of saying the author uses we'll say um, emotional appeal and credibility uh, to persuade their audience to read his book. Okay, let's let's look at some things here that we could fix. And again, this is looking at a thesis. 
Okay, one thing right off the bat, get rid of that, the author. Say the name. It's Clarence Jones. Now, some people were getting kind of confused with this piece because it mentions that he has a co-writer for the book Behind the Dream, which is true. But what we're focused on is the prologue. And if you look at the prologue, it's obvious that it's written by one person. It's in talking. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he speaks in first person. Uh, it's clearly one person writing it. Uh, based on the rhetorical situation they give us, we know that that person is Clarence Jones. So you don't have to. Some of you were doing citation, which is fine if you cite right. It just shows more academic knowledge. Uh, but you don't have to add his co-author with all the citation because you're not really talking about the book. You're just talking about the prologue. And you make that obvious in your own rhetorical situation. Uh, so Stuart Conley, you don't really have to mention him. If in your introduction you want to mention that he and Stuart Conley wrote a book, that's fine. But throughout the piece, when you're talking about the prologue, you don't have to refer to Conley. You don't have to give him credit. He didn't really write the prologue. Um, so Clarence Jones... Okay, second thing, let's take a look at the word uses. This is a trigger word. <laughs> People, uh, teachers, graders, they hate this because it, it leads to some lazy name dropping. Uses is not a very good verb here. What I want you to do is I want you to try to be more descriptive with verbs. Okay, so instead of saying uses emotional appeal, notice that emotional appeal, that's an adjective. And that is... A noun. Credibility is a noun. I want you to get rid of these nouns as much as possible and describe what the author is doing. So kind of, I don't want to say verbalize because that means something else, um, but create a verb form to describe what the author is doing. So Clarence Jones, he doesn't use emotional appeal. Clarence Jones appeals, that's a verb, to the emotions of his audience. Okay. And instead of uses credibility, which is basically the structure of what's above, Clarence Jones appeals to the emotions of his audience and he, you could say bolsters, meaning to build up his own credibility. His credibility. Okay. Um, do I need to get into, because I'm talking about appeals. They're not the same as techniques. I don't want to say Clarence Jones appeals to the emotions of his audience and bolsters his credibility and uses diction. Or and uses background information. Those things are not equal. Appeals are on their own level. Appeals aren't used. They are created. How do you create an appeal? How do you pull on somebody's emotional heartstrings? You use techniques. So techniques are used to create appeals. So we don't list in a thesis appeals and uh, techniques as if they're at the same level. We show that we understand that appeals are created by techniques. Do we have to go and talk about the actual techniques? No, not here. Here I've got two appeals that could become two buckets, right? The techniques that create the emotional uh, appeals, so let's say imagery is one of the strong things he uses. We'll talk about that when we're talking about the bucket that's centered around uh, emotional appeal. So I'll come up with a couple of techniques he uses, because remember the two to one always have Two pieces of evidence for your claim. My claim is that he creates emotional appeal. Let me find at least two ways that he does that. So one of them might be imagery that creates emotion. Uh, another could be, I could use his parallelism. He creates uh, his own rhythm and cadence in his papers in places that kind of builds power. Um, and he's very self-aware of that rhetorical technique because remember, uh, he actually refers to King's strong cadence. So it's something he's aware of. And cadence is just another word for rhythm. Um, 
so talk about appeals if you want to talk about appeals. And then the actual techniques that create those appeals you can get to in the body paragraphs. Or if you want to put techniques in here, I strongly suggest you focus on structural techniques, not just style techniques. Uh, often what will happen is if you come up with a structure, what are the big building blocks that he's using? If you come up with the structural techniques, you'll realize that they also include a lot of uh, your style elements. And you'll talk about those a little bit in those body paragraphs. So big thing, big pet peeve, don't mix appeals with techniques. Now, if you want to show the relationship between them and say something like uh, Clarence Jones appeals to the emotions of his readers through strong imagery and uh, personal experience, you can do that because I didn't list them as separate things, treating them as equal things. I clearly stated that the emotion was caused by his use of the other techniques, okay? Techniques create appeals. They're not on the same level. So as long as you acknowledge it explicitly, just don't give me a list that says the author uses emotional appeal, diction, and background information. That doesn't work. Another one, pet peeve, is diction. People love this because everybody can find it. It's in every paper. You can't write without diction. You're going to choose some words, right? This has become a shortcut. This has kind of become the life raft that people grab onto when they're drowning and they don't know what to do. People like to throw down diction. Not only is this a style element, which is, you know, lesser consequence than structural elements, uh, but it's probably the weakest of them because you can't write, you can't speak without diction. And when people say so-and-so uses diction, Newsflash, everybody who's ever spoken uses diction. You're choosing the words. Now, are you choosing them purposefully? To some extent, yeah. This in itself is weak. If you want to talk about specific words, like if he's using um, words that are patriotic, okay, um, but I wouldn't even use the word diction. Um, I would talk about uh, how he appeals to a person's sense of patriotism, uh, you know, by using strong emotional terms. And, and then what you want to do in a, if you have a body paragraph where you're actually going to talk about diction, you have to have individual words that you put in quotes and you talk about the actual effect of that word, of those words. You have to give examples of the particular words you're talking about and what their actual effects are. Um, but this is often overused. Often when people are writing about diction, I'll see that they want to do a bucket about diction and another bucket about imagery. That really shouldn't happen because usually it's that very diction that creates that strong imagery. So what you would do is you would write about the imagery and in that discussion, in your analytical body paragraph, then you can bring in and talk about some specific word choices that help build that imagery. So you can speak about it. But again, I wouldn't even use the word diction. That's an uh, it's one of these archaic, um, definitely academic terms. And what we want to do as much as possible is make it seem as though you are a good writer. You are an intelligent, well-read person. You are not somebody who took a rhetorical analysis class and did really well on the vocabulary and knows all the words for everything. Um, in a sense, that belies your sense of sophistication. You want to be able to speak without saying things <laughs> like chiasmus, because I know this at this level, we tend to think that, oh, if I show that I know all these words, it gives me credibility. It makes me seem more intelligent. Um, in this setting where everyone's writing rhetorical analysis essays and these people are going to be grading hundreds of them in a sitting, uh, 
they're going to get rhetorical analysis vocabulary overload. It's better, it's more sophisticated for you to take these concepts, these notions um, that can be somewhat complicated. Trying to explain what chiasmus is to somebody can be tricky. Um, but if you can take complex notions and put them in everyday speech, at least every day, keep in mind your audience is either a teacher or a professor. Um, you don't want to speak like you're speaking to a friend on the basketball court, of course. Um, but put it in the language that is more conversational, that shows sophistication, okay? You still show that you see it, you understand it, you know what's happening, uh, but you're not just dropping vocabulary words because what happens is we tend to drop the vocabulary word and then just move on without much explanation. We feel like we've done it. Oh, we found it, we identified it. Uh, just remember, identification is on the bottom of... Uh, you know, the hierarchy of complex thinking skills. Uh, we want to get more into the analysis. Um, so often we're too proud of ourselves. We, we've identified chiasmus. We say the author uses chiasmus and we just throw down a quote. We never explain it. Don't even say chiasmus uh, unless you, you know, here and there if you need to. Um, if it's a more common term, like paradox is pretty common. Um, I'll definitely talk about paradox sometimes. But some of the more archaic, just off the wall things you've never heard of, except in our classroom, avoid those terms if you can. See if you can just describe what the author is doing using verbs and de-emphasize those nouns, and that's going to help. But again, if you're trying to talk about diction and imagery, you should be talking about imagery. And in that conversation, if you want to point out some specific words, that's fine. But those two things are too close together and too interlocked to make separate buckets out of. And you're going to end up with two style elements, which is already not great. Okay, because remember, we're trying to emphasize the structure. What are the big building blocks, the planning? When they sat down to plan their essay, how did they, what big building blocks, what pieces did they need to put into place? What sections of the essay are there and what are their functions? That's what you think about for structure, not specific words, specific sentences. Those are just sort of the tricks, little tricks. Um, focus on the big building box. Okay, um, got some of the pet peeves out of the way here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm just now talking about structure and sequence, meaning uh, I need to do this first and then I can do this. So maybe I'm going to write a speech and I'm going to talk about coronavirus. Okay. First off, knowing my audience, everyone feels like they've heard enough about coronavirus. Maybe they're sick of it. Okay. So I'm going to acknowledge that they are inundated. information. So I'm just going to acknowledge, look, I know you've heard a lot. I know you're tired of hearing about it. I know it's not lightening the mood to read my paper or hear my speech or whatever I'm presenting, but I might do a whole paragraph early on in my intro that just acknowledges that I realize that they're tired of hearing about it. But dun, 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 uh, I'm going to, you know, I have to offer them something interesting, something new. So then I'm going to segue into what's new, what new information I have. Um, maybe the next part I need to speak about is um, what they can do. All right. And again, this is all just hypothetical. I don't actually have a great plan for coronavirus. Um, so this is to ease their anxiety. This is a counter argument because they're going to be saying, look, we've got plenty of information. So I'm letting them know, look, I know you're inundated. I know you've heard a lot. However, I've got something to share. It's interesting. Uh, and here's what you can do now that you know this. That's going to be my whole presentation. Those are the three parts, okay, that I'm going to focus on. 
when you read somebody's essay, you need to be able to recognize what they're doing and in what order they're doing it and what the sequence is. Why does this relate to this? Well, I needed to get this done so that they would listen to this. Now that they listen to this, they're asking themselves a question. Okay, so what? What do I do? Well, here's what you can do with this information. If these things were in a different order, it wouldn't work. I've planned it out this way. It's a structural sequence. Structural elements, okay? Um, so be able to just read a piece, break it into its plan. What was the plan? What were they trying to do with each each piece? Think of music. In music, you have movements. Um, similar. This movement is going to um, build uh, excitement. This next movement you know, is going to connect uh, the theme of this character with, I have another movement coming up that's another character's theme. So this middle piece of the song uh, needs to sort of commingle these two different melodies, which are, you know, themes for characters. Um, it's just like that. Break it into pieces. See what this relationship is between them. You should be able to see this, see this pretty quickly. And then this gives you what you need to turn around and write your analysis. Okay. And you're focused on structure, which is great. You might end up getting into some techniques once you get into these buckets and talking about these pieces, um, which is great. There's nothing wrong with talking about style. It just shouldn't be the focus of your essay most of the time. It's, it's something real you know, specific. If, if an author is just using an awful lot of imagery and it is the, the key to the success of their piece, then sure, talk about imagery. But if they're using an awful lot of it, chances are imagery is, can actually be a structural thing in that case. Okay. Almost any style technique can be elevated up to a structural level. Okay. Um, just depends on, are, are you referring to a sentence where they use the technique? Or are you referring to a paragraph that's based where the technique itself is sort of uh, the whole center of that, the concept for that paragraph, everything relies on it. Then you can argue it being justified to include. Okay, um, analytical paragraphs real quick. So once you have your buckets and you're going to get into your actual body paragraphs, your analytical paragraphs, um, just remember these elements. You make the claim, you embed a quote. Embed just means you blend the quote with your own analysis. You don't have a separate sentence for the quote. You make a claim, the author is doing something, you embed a quote, you explain it. This step gets people sometimes. Um, they want to just put down the quote and say, see, this shows that. No, it doesn't. You have to explain how that works. Um, if you're telling me that this allusion to American history um, creates a sense of patriotism, just in a sentence, explain to me how that works. Why does the mention of Alexander Hamilton make people feel patriotic? Um, just even some things that seem obvious, if you're taking an exam, just go ahead and throw it out there. Um, just mention it. So explain, you know, Hamilton being, a uh, however you want to get it, being a, at one point, a protege to George Washington, uh, being key in many of the I guess the events that led to the founding of our nation, on and on and on, but just mention it. Just killed my eraser. Okay, anyway. Uh, after you, you make a claim, you embed your quote, you explain it. This step is very important. This keeps you from falling back into more of uh, just summary and literary analysis. Literary analysis. Uh, this is the effect on the reader. So how does this particular 
use or instance of this particular technique affect the reader? Don't tell me how parallelism usually has an effect on a re reader in a very general term or in, in general terms. Talk about this particular quote. What is the effect it's going to have? Okay. And you'll see that some of these, like your explanation and the effect on the reader, often those are going to be kind of covered in the same sentence. That's fine. Um, you don't have to have a sentence for each of these. This is just, uh, these are just the elements that need to find their way into your analytical paragraph somewhere. And the last thing is tie it to the overall purpose. All right. If all of that's in your paragraph, you're good to go. The trick is to not go one, two, three, four, five, and have this very uh, mechanical approach. Let me get another pencil. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and read through this piece. So, this is um, the Clarence Jones prologue. I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to go through just as if I'm going to be talking out loud, basically, as I go through this. All right. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. co-wrote his I Have a Dream speech with his close confidant, Clarence Jones. In 2011, Clarence Jones and Stuart Connolly published Behind the Dream, a behind-the-scenes account of the weeks leading up to King's delivery of that speech at the March on Washington. The following passage is an excerpt from the prologue to Behind the Dream. Okay, read that again. The following passage is an excerpt, meaning a piece not the full thing, from the prologue to Behind the Dream. So Behind the Dream is a book he wrote. The prologue is sort of the introductory chapter, you can say. Um, so it's going to get people ready to read the book. Read the passage carefully. Write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices Jones makes to achieve his purpose. So this is the standard rhetorical analysis. Just look for the choices he makes to achieve his purpose. You always have to identify what his purpose is. You can't turn around and write an essay saying, uh, in order to, um, you know, he does this, this, and this, uh, in order to convey his purpose. Your job is to tell us uh, what that is, okay? Show that you understand the purpose. Okay, um, this is just general rhetorical analysis, what you need to do. All right, let's go ahead and read the piece. So again, this is a prologue from a book written by Clarence Jones and Stuart Conley. But the prologue itself, uh, we're only being asked to comment on Jones. So I'm assuming that the prologue itself is written by Clarence Jones, not both people. Uh, and we'll verify that because of the first person language throughout. Okay, here we go. A quarter of a million people, human beings who generally had spent their lives treated as something less, stood shoulder to shoulder across the vast lawn, their hearts beating as one, hope on the line, when hope was an increasingly scarce resource. Okay, that's good. It's emotional. It uses some irony. Um, strong imagery to create that emotion. Um, shoulder to shoulder across that vast lawn. What lawn are we talking about? They're alluding to um, the Lincoln Memorial, I believe. Because again, this is about Martin Luther King Jr.'s delivery of the speech and what led up to it. Their hearts beating as one. Hope on the line when hope was an increasingly scarce resource. So he's taking us back, um, background information, putting us there that day. There is no dearth of prose describing the mass of humanity that made its way to the feet of the great emancipator. Talking about Abraham Lincoln here. Uh, there is no dearth of prose. Um, that is, there is no uh, absence of, you know, beautiful writing describing the mass of humanity that made its way to the feet. A lot of people have written about it, is what that means. No metaphor that has slipped through the cracks. So all the metaphors have been used, waiting to be discovered, dusted off and ejected into the discourse a half century on. So he's not going to be able to say anything to describe uh, that mass of humanity. He's not going to have some new exciting metaphor that's going to 
change the way we look at things. He's telling us what he can't do. The March on Washington has been compared to a tsunami, a shockwave, a wall, a living monument, a mosaic, an outright miracle. Okay, so the March on Washington has been compared to a tsunami. So what we have here, first off, he's alluding to what other authors have called this event. Okay, uh, he's also focused on metaphors. Um, he's also using in his sentence structure, the March of Washington has been compared to a tsunami, a shockwave, a wall, a living monument, a human mosaic, an outright miracle. Uh, Ace and Denton. Again, I'm taking notes, so I'm going to drop the words because it's a shortcut. This is why you need to know the words so you're not fumbling around. I just have something I can look at. I understand what it is. When I go to write my essay, though, I'm not going to use that language. It was all of those things. And if you saw it with your own eyes, it wasn't hard to write about. But that many people in one place crying for something so elemental. Again, we have emotion here. You don't have to be Robert Frost. He's alluding to a poet to offer some profound eloquence. So a lot of anyone who is there can write about this. Anyone who's there could write beautiful things. That's not what he's getting at, or that's not what this book is going to be. So a lot of people, real quick side note, a lot of people wrote, they picked this as if this was his use of metaphor, a tsunami, a shockwave, a wall, a living monument. Uh, and they talked about his use of metaphor to build power and emotion. Yeah, but he's alluding to what other people have called it. His actual point, his purpose in this is to show that he doesn't have anything to add. He's actually building his credibility by being humble. He's letting you know, I'm not the great writer that's going to come along and blow up the world with my new metaphor. So you got to look at the, why he's doing this. What is he doing in sequence here? Uh, he's lowering your expectations. Okay. So don't focus on this and say, oh, look, he's using all this language to really show how powerful it was. Yeah, but that's not what he's doing. That's what other people were doing. What he's doing is using this to say, this is other people have said beautiful things. That's not what I'm here to do. And we're still waiting to see exactly what he is here to do. And here he's saying, you don't have to be Robert Frost to say beautiful things. Again, he's lowering expectations. Let's keep going. Still, I can say to those who know the event only is a steely black and white television image, it's a shame that the colors of that day, the blue sky, the vibrant green, the golden sun everywhere, are not part of our national memory. Okay, so people who've only seen it on TV, which in 2011, when this was written, is most people. Um, it's a shame that all they have is that black and white television image. And then he has some rich imagery here. Um, and he contrasts, right? Juxtaposes. He contrasts the video image with actually being there. They are not part of our national memory. There is something heart-wrenching about the widely shown images and film clips of the event that belies the joy of the day, um, which undercuts the joy of the day, which fails to show the joy of the day. But it could be worse. We could have been marching in an era before cameras and recording devices. Yeah, there's a little counter-argument. At least we have that, is what he's saying. His point isn't, thank God we have technology, otherwise it would be lost. His point is that yeah, at least we have the film footage, but it doesn't even come close to comparing to actually being there, right? The blue sky, the vibrant green life. All right, here we go. Then the specifics of the event would eventually fade out of living memory and the world would be left only with the mythology in the text. Text without context, in this case especially, would be quite a loss. One might imagine standing before an audience and reading Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech verbatim, but it is a stretch to believe that any such performance would sow the seeds of change with, as Dr. King put it that day in Washington, the fierce urgency of now. Okay, so he's talking about text without context here. 
you can't just read King's speech and recreate the energy, the event itself. There's too much more. The context around that is what's so powerful, not just the words. Okay. Yet. No, oh, sorry. I lost my place. Okay, we are. The vast crowd, the great speaker, the words that shook the world, it all comes as a package deal. Okay, so we have this nice uh, periodic sense that's got lots of parallelism here. He's got a nice rhythm when he writes, the vast crowd, the great speaker, the words that shook the world, it all comes as a package deal. Uh, we are truly fortunate to have a record. Yet what the television cameras and radio microphones captured that August day is but a sliver of the vibrancy of the event. So he's actually dogging the footage, saying it's not enough. It's, it's just a sliver. When a film adaptation of a beloved novel premieres, so we have this, I think he's going to create a metaphor for us, right? Maybe an extended metaphor. The people who say, oh, but you've got to read the book are inevitably right. The density of the written word makes the flat motion picture a pell artifact in comparison. In a similar fashion, so he's creating an analogy between reading a book versus watching a movie and watching the Martin Luther King film footage and, oh, what's that? Reading his book. Okay. Uh, in a similar fashion, although watching the black and white news footage of Dr. King's historic call to action is stirring to almost everyone who sees it, learning about the work that went into the march, the speech, the discussions and debates behind closed doors, offers a unique context that magnifies the resonance of hearing those famous words, I have a dream, and that phenomenal, imitable cadence. Okay, so this whole chunk, okay, he, he first starts out, he introduces himself a little bit just by saying, hey, I'm not the great writer that's going to blow your mind with poetry and metaphors. Um, this was a significant event. Here he lets us know that he was there, and by being there, he can tell us what he experienced and what most of us, because again, this is published in 2011, know of that day or just that watching that film footage, uh, they don't compare. That the book is better than the movie. And in this case, he means his book is better than just watching that film footage. Okay, let's keep going. If taken together, the images and recordings of Martin, uh, this is something I tell you guys to never do. I always say, don't use their first name. You're not their friend. Well, he is. So this is something else that gives him credibility. The fact that he can refer to him as Martin because they were confident. If taken together, the images and recordings of Martin make up that movie of the 1963 March on Washington in our collective consciousness. And if it's true, as people often say, that if you love the movie, you've got to read the book. Behind the dream is that book. Ooh, there we go. Does this look like maybe the author's purpose is to promote his book? Yes. It is a story not known to the general public or disclosed to participants in the march or, in fact, to many of its organizers. So he has inside information. I acquired private truths and quiet insights. That's what he's offering us. Not the beautiful language. Where are we at here? Not the metaphors, not the poetry. He's not Robert Frost. What he has is private truths and quiet insights. So behind the scenes stuff. During the months leading up to this historic event, for the most part, I've kept them to myself. But as this book is published, I will be entering my eighth decade on Earth. So he's in his 80s. And I, and as I move closer to the final horizon, nice metaphor for death, euphemism, right? I realize the time has come to share what I know. The experience that cannot die with me. The full truth is simply too important to history. This is his exigence. This is what gets him up off the couch to write the book. He's going to die, and he doesn't want to take all these great insights, these secrets, these behind-the-scene intimate moments with Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement to the grave with him. So he writes the book. So his exigence, 
the urgency of him doing this is that he's getting older. The purpose of the prologue, which is what we're analyzing, is to build interest and let you feel as though you're missing something just by watching that film footage. He's going to offer you the thing that you're missing. Um, so his purpose is more of to promote his book. He has to create value for his book because there are a lot of books written about Martin Luther King Jr., that speech, the march. Um, so he has to, in this prologue, show the value of it. So he shows you what he's not going to do, what many other people have done, but then he's going to let you know that what you know, he lets you know that what you know is not enough. That you, like most people, watch the video footage, you're missing out. You have basically text without context. If you want the context, you read the book. Okay? So we can see he has a sequence here. He starts out, he builds his own credibility by saying, yes, I was there. And in an ironic way of building credibility, he's humble. This kind of confuses people sometimes. But if he comes out and he's just like, I'm, I wrote the best book ever, it's going to blow your mind, we wouldn't listen to him. That self-promotion, self-aggrandizement doesn't really come across as an attractive trait. By being humble and saying, I'm no Robert Frost, I'm not going to add to the poetry of what's been said about that day, uh, we're at least going to listen to him. Because we now want to know, well, what, what are you going to add? Why are we going to read your book? And then this whole thing is he's going to let you know that what, what you know of that day is inadequate. He educates you. Your knowledge of those events lacks context. And I've got the context. So if you're looking for structure, just take his essay and break it into what he's doing. And then you can group that into what you're going to focus on and write about. So the first thing he does, uh, it's a little self-deprecating. Um, but builds credibility. This is ironic by stating what he isn't able to do. This happens in the beginning of his prologue. Uh, think about an attention grabber in an essay. How does he get your attention? Well, by saying... I'm not the guy that you hope I am. Uh, it's interesting. So people are going to keep reading. But he does get some credibility right out of the gate, just because we know early on that he is a confidant of Martin Luther King Jr. He co-wrote the speech. He doesn't say that 50 times, does he? He doesn't have to. Uh, he's being very humble. This is the man who helped Dr. King write the speech. He's already got a lot of credibility. You don't want to come him out and hear him talking about how close he was with King and how he's going to um, write a book that's going to blow our minds. Uh, what he's doing is a little more nuanced, and I want you to be able to see the nuance. That's what's going to give you the sophistication point on an AP exam. So he builds credibility of saying what he isn't able to do. He's no Robert Frost. He's All these great metaphors have already been used. Uh, the next thing he does is he has this six, uh, extended metaphor comparing a book to a movie uh, contrasting book to movie what is the purpose of this to show that his audience is missing context of the event. And he creates, what's the effect on the reader? He creates this desire to have what you're missing. FOMO, fear of missing out, right? All right, so first thing he does, second thing he does, third thing he does is uh, he lets us know that he has offers the context to us and explains why. Um, he will pass on 
what does that do? It creates a sense of urgency. Like, oh, this guy's going to die. It's kind of funny because the book's already written. Even if he dies, he's already done what he needed to do. Uh, but it is interesting. And it, uh, knowing that he's going to die, it's emotional. Death is emotional. We're losing another person that knew a figure that's of huge historical significance who has passed away. And now, you know, as each of their confidants begin to pass, we lose more and more of the picture of who that original person was. Um, so this definitely works on several levels. Um, by mentioning his exigence and it being an emotional thing, because he's going to die soon. And this is just because he's in his 80s. He doesn't say the, he has a terminal illness, but we can assume he's not going to live forever. Um, it creates even a little more, more urgency. It shows that he's that much more humble uh that he's worried about king's legacy and he wants to do his part um it's kind of a sweet sentimental effect now if i'm going to break this into buckets and write about it um these three pieces i could just go in and write about them these are all structural things right um, here he compares himself to other authors to show what he is enabled to do. And I could just write it out like that. I don't have to come up with a technique name. Um, use verbs. Just describe what he's doing. And then my body paragraph, I'm going to go and point out some of the, um, yeah, I'll use those metaphors too. I'm going to put a quote in, but I'm going to also mention that he's referring to how other people have described the event. Uh, in order to show that he can't really outdo them. He's no Robert Frost. I'll embed something about that. Um, anyone who's there can write about it. So he's, when I get into the purpose and all of that section, uh, it's going to be to show that he's not here to add to the beauty, the poetic descriptions. Uh, that's not what he has to offer. And then I'm going to go into the next bucket, the extended metaphor. He's, uh, I'll say that he, instead of saying he uses an extended metaphor, I'm going to say he contrasts uh, a novel to a movie, creating an extended metaphor that shows uh, his audience, who has probably only seen the film footage, is missing all the greater context of having been there that day. The effect of that, when I get into that, I'm going to have embedded quotes. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to, what's the effect on the reader? It makes the reader feel like they're missing out, like they're missing something. And their knowledge, their understanding, their emotional connection to these great historical moments. Um, and the last section is practical. He offers the quiet insights. Um, don't get hung up on vocabulary. Don't get hung up on the five canons. Look at what he's doing in each piece and turn those into your buckets. Describe what he's doing in your own words. That's more powerful um, than throwing down a bunch of vocabulary. Okay, and it keeps it from being mechanical. You can get the sophistication point. All right. Um, Okay, I just drafted a quick, uh, like time right intro and thesis, and I want to show you something. I did this very much, sort of an open thesis. I didn't go and pin down my buckets in the thesis itself. The information's there. It's gonna be in my essay, and if you really look for it, you'll be able to go in and find it. After you see what my buckets are, you'll be able to go and say, okay, yeah, it's there. This is considered more sophisticated than just saying he uses blank, blank, and blank in order to blank. But it's also a little bit riskier in that you have to have good command of language. You have to have good confidence, um, and you have to actually address these things. 
excuse me, in your essay. Um, but if you're comfortable enough, then do it. Um, if you want to be more mechanical with the thesis and provide that structure, go ahead, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but I want to just show you an example of this. Uh, some of you can definitely, we're definitely there. Uh, in 2011, Clarence Jones, confidant of Martin Luther King Jr. and co-author of the I Have a Dream speech, published Behind the Dream. In his prologue, he seeks to establish himself. Look, I didn't even mention Stuart Conley, who co-wrote the book Behind the Dream. Uh, because the prologue doesn't, this essay doesn't really focus on it at all. So I'm not going to worry about it. In his prologue, he seeks to establish himself not as a poet or wordsmith, but as a friend of kings who has acquired private truths and quiet insights that can enrich our understanding of that momentous day when King addressed the nation. Okay, you can see what, I apologize for my handwriting. That's going the wrong way. Back up, back up. Okay. So what rhetorical choices does he make? I've just kind of described what he's offering, what his purpose is, in pretty general terms. I didn't really get into specific rhetorical choices, but my essay is definitely going to be based on those. Um, but this is a way to do a thesis that's not quite as prescriptive. And if you write a good essay and you do hit on those rhetorical choices adequately, um, this will actually give you more sophistication because it doesn't sound like a thesis. It doesn't feel like a thesis, but the same information is actually there. He seeks to establish himself not as a poet or wordsmith, but as a friend of kings. That's that first part I talked about. Uh, who's acquired private truths and quiet insights. That's actually the third part of his essay. Uh, and then here I hit on the second part. It can enrich our understanding of that momentous day because that's where he compares to show us that our understanding is deficit is in that second part. So mine's not even in, necessarily in the order that it's written. I wrote it in the order that it sounds the best. It makes the most sense. But you can definitely see all three sections of his essay covered in this thesis. So when I write, I'm going to do like basically three buckets. I'm going to talk about that introduction piece where he's self-deprecating, uh, where he actually ironically creates credibility for himself by being humble, by telling us what he is not, what he cannot provide, that he can't do better than those who came before him. He alludes to uh, the others. I'm going to write about the second piece where I'm going to focus on his use of the extended metaphor for watching a movie versus uh, reading the book. And he creates an analogy between his book and a beloved novel and a movie of that novel compared to the footage of King. That's my second bucket. And my third bucket uh, is going to be that little end piece where he talks about his private truths and quiet insights. Um, I like that he has this understated, you want to talk about diction? I can. He has this understated uh, word choice here, private truths. There's a softness to that. Quiet insights. There's a softness to that. He's not coming out with this big, bold, you know, me and King were bros. He has intimacy in his language. Um, I think that infers leaves us to infer that he had real intimate connections with King um, and was closer to him than many of uh, the other people who were part of, you know, King's uh, other confidants of King. Um, I think I will end this here. Um, maybe I'll do a more structured one just to show you the different options. I'll do that. Okay, real quick, I just want to show you another example. This is one I'm not encouraging. 
this is what I think often people will do thinking, oh, this is what they want. And it's much more prescriptive. It's much more technique, technique, technique. Um, so in this case, I kept the same intro piece. In his prologue, he builds his credibility, employs an extended metaphor, and reveals his emotionally charged exigence in order to promote his book. So I've given three techniques, basically, except notice I did something with the first one that I tell you not to do. Um, three techniques and then the purpose. That's more of a normal closed thesis. Uh, thesis statement that we're used to. This is something they want to see less of. If you want the sophistication point, um, get away from focusing on the nouns, the techniques, and just describe with verbal language what he's doing. Um, you'll notice the thing I was talking about here. He builds his credibility, employs an extended metaphor, and reveals his emotionally charged actions in order to promote his book. This isn't great because credibility is not a technique and I'm listing it along with techniques. I don't show that I understand that an appeal is created by techniques. Um, you're not gonna fail the AP exam with this. It's gonna be okay, you're gonna get your thesis point, um, but you're not gonna get the sophistication. Um, but even this builds his credibility, that's way better than just saying, uses ethos, right? Um, employs an extended metaphor. That's better than saying uses extended metaphor. Reveals his emotionally charged exigence. Um, I don't even know what to do with that one. Uh, this isn't as mechanical as it could be, but hopefully you can see in this process, the steps, uh, the variation here, um what we're working toward this right here has all of that information it's just a little softer it doesn't read like a rhetorical analysis thesis in his prologue he seeks to establish himself not as a poet or wordsmith but as a friend of kings who has acquired private truths quiet insights that can enrich our understandings of that momentous day when king addressed the nation um same stuff is there Still sets up my essay. It gives me my buckets. It's just not as obvious until after you read my essay. So it's a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, and I think it reads a little bit more naturally. Doesn't sound like an essay. Definitely doesn't sound as much like a thesis. Okay, I'm going to end this here. Um, you guys test on Wednesday. Good luck. Make sure at this point, make sure you have the email. Uh, that you've located that. Go back through and read the instructions. The, I gave you a PowerPoint. I gave you links uh, for testers. Go start parsing through that information. Make that your priority. Uh, if you're taking the AP exam, you can focus on that. I wouldn't worry so much about the weekly assignment because you're going to have next week after your exam to get everything in that you need to get in. Uh, and I'm going to give you guys credit.